Howard University, one of America's preeminent institutions of higher education in this country and one of the first historically black colleges and universities. A who's who of black America has entered this classroom. United Nations Ambassador Andrew Young, dancer and producer Debbie Allen, and California Senator and Presidential Candidate Kamala Harris are just a small sample of the millions who cross this hallowed ground, not just for an education, but to make a difference in the world. But speaking of those grounds, Howard is located in the heart of Black Washington, D.C. Chocolate City, as George Clinton once famously called it, except Chocolate City has turned into a Taylor Swift friendly with two pumps of almond milk district. And those almond milks are demanding things. Recently, some colonizers decided to move from behind their gentrification fences, it's a thing, look it up, and let their dogs run rampant on the beautiful campus. The campus is so gorgeous, they say. And the one place they really love laying their little Fifi's frolic is on the one of the main quads at Howard University, the yard. Ah, the yard. The place where for over 150 years, Howard students have gathered to chill, eat lunch between classes, and generally feel the blackness that is Howard University. When alums come back to dear old Howard, the yard is what makes homecoming feel like homecoming. And yet these gentrifiers felt like they had a right to let their lassies defecate and pee on fraternity and sorority plots. Generally go all Rick James dirty boots on Howard's green grasses, all because, you know, the whiteness. Now that didn't go over well with the Howard students to take it, uh, to say it lightly. In fact, one descendant of Miss Millie had an audacity to suggest that if Howard students didn't like their dogs on their campus, that perhaps Howard should move its campus. To which Howard students responded by saying, hell no. Nah. These new folks, I think they need a bit of knowledge as to why Howard isn't like your local predominantly white campus in Washington, D.C. That the Howard campus as a black space needs to be respected. Luckily for you, I'm here for it. My name is Lawrence Ross, so grab your dog leeches as I'm about to summon the pride of Wakanda. Howard class of 2000 graduate and the one and only Black Panther. As we put some respect on the name of Howard University in this episode of Brain Coco. The Civil War is over. The South is vanquished and millions of formerly enslaved Africans are now African Americans. Most have been denied even the basis of an education as it had been outlawed in the South and even in the North had been severely restricted. Religious groups throughout the country began constructing freedmen schools to educate these former slaves and DC was no different. In 1866, the first Congressional Society of Washington, DC came up with a plan to start a new theological school for blacks. But you know, after a bit of discussion, these good white folks began thinking to themselves, what if everybody doesn't want to be a reverend? What if everyone doesn't want to be the future John Gray or T.D. Jakes? Maybe we should build an actual university. So in 1867, the new university was chartered. Cool, cool, we're good. University for Blacks, got it. But hey, what should we call it? If you're going to name a university designed to serve Blacks, should it be named after maybe a Black person? Maybe Douglas University or Tubman University, or if they had a crystal ball and found a fortune teller, Oprah University, well, I'm just saying. So yeah, it seemed like it would be a natural choice to name this new university after someone black, but instead they named the university after this fella, General Oliver Otis Howard, or Big O.O. as he was known to his boys. No, not really, I'm just gonna call him that. Known as the Christian General, Big O.O. was in some of the worst battles in the Civil War, losing an arm in the process, thus becoming an instant Civil War hero. After the war, he was made a commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau, a government agency designed to protect newly free blacks. Well, I'll more on the Freedmen's Bureau in a later Brank Oko, but for now, know that one of the mandates of the Bureau was to establish schools for blacks. During its run, the Bureau established over 1,000 schools from elementary schools to high schools to colleges for blacks all across the country. And by all accounts, when it came to African Americans, Howard was about that life when it came to supporting black folks. Now, you, you gotta take this with a grain of salt. 
we're talking about you know being about that life as a 19th century white dude could be so a lot of it was patronizing but at least he did say this about what howard university's mission was to be and i quote intelligent youth at the nation's capital whatever may have been their previous condition the benefits of a complete collegiate course and a thorough professional training and howard university took to that mission with gusto they grew from a single frame building in 1867 and soon began expanding in 1868, Howard University College of Medicine opened. In 1870, the theological department was formed, the same thing that they all wanted to do at the beginning. And Frederick Douglass, the most important African-American in the country, was elected to the Howard University Board of Trustees in 1871. He ended up being the longest serving trustee in Howard University history. One of the most important additions to the history of the United States and the civil rights movement in general would be the establishment of the first black law school, the Howard Law School right at the end of the Re Reconstruction era. In fact, Howard Law School alum, Charlotte E. Ray, would be the first African-American woman to graduate from any law school in the country, and she'd be the very first woman admitted to the District of Columbia Bar. But Howard wasn't even done. The Howard University College of Dentistry was founded in 1881, and now, today, is the fifth oldest dental school in the United States. And I think when you look at it, it should be noted that the establishment of a liberal arts university, a medical school, a law school, a dental school, a theological school, showed that Howard University was dedicated from its beginnings to providing a first-class infrastructure for African Americans, despite existing in a white supremacist world. This is a white supremacist world that had declared blacks to be permanent second-class citizens. It's also the reason why Howard University would be labeled the capstone of Negro education. Now, in the 20th century, an 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson decision codified separate but equal Jim Crow segregation in this land. It's now the law land. And this also meant that there was an added emphasis on blacks gaining college education. The W.B. Du Bois theory of the talented 10th, or creation of a black educated elite, meant that many black college uh, graduates saw themselves not just as college students, but more as race men or race women who are not just going to college for their own education, but also for the uplift of the black race in itself. In other words, the greatest way to deconstruct a false idea of white supremacy was to prove oneself capabilities, capabilities individually and as a race. A prime example of this was the presence at Howard University of Dr. Ernest Everett Just. One of America's greatest biologists and zoologists, Dr. Just would gain recognition in his research into the fundamental role of cell surface in the development of organisms. He would also advise in the founding of Omega Psi Phi fraternity at Howard University. And speaking of African-American fraternities and sororities, five of the nine fraternities and sororities, Alpha Kappa Alpha, Delta Sigma Theta, Zeta Phi Beta, Omega Psi Phi, and Phi Beta Sigma would be founded at Howard University. And if you really want to know more about them, you want, might want to read my own book, The Divine Nine, The History of African American Fraternities and Sororities, but I digress. Anyway, a key turning point in the history of Howard was the appointment of a black president, Dr. Mordecai Johnson in 1926. By the way, don't you think black folks need to bring back the name Mordecai? Just saying. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Should we bring back Mordecai to more people uh, when they're born? Anyway, prior to Dr. Johnson's appointment, all 10 of the previous Howard presidents had been white. Dr. Johnson would serve as president of Howard for 34 years, up until 1960, sparking a Howard University renaissance, both creating the modern Howard campus, but also intellectually. During his tenure, the Howard faculty was in perpetual beast mode when it came to intellectual capacity. There, here are just some of the people who were at Howard. Dr. Elaine Locke, Chair of the Department of Philosophy, first African-American Rhodes Scholar. Dr. Ralph Bunch, first African-American Nobel Peace Prize winner and Chair of the Department of Political Science. Dr. Kelly Miller, Dean of the College of Art and Sciences, known as the Bard of Potomac and was one of the leading intellectuals of his time. Lucy Dick Slow, the first black woman to serve as a Dean of Women at any American university and the first Dean of Women at Howard University. Also, one of the founders of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. You had Carter G. Woodson, who was the Dean of Liberal Arts and the father of black history, including the father of Black History Month. Sterling Allen Brown, department chair of English, who met her some such writers you may have heard of. Toni Morrison, Pulitzer Prize winner, the first president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, 
actor Ozzie Davis, Amiri Barakar. He also had one of the greatest quotes about black folks in Harvard ever, but you kind of have to look that one up all for yourselves. But it would be the appointment of Charles Hamilton Houston in 1929 as the dean of Howard University School of Law that would change the shape of America. Houston would not only turn an unaccredited night law school at Howard University into an accredited institution, but his groundbreaking work in documenting the inequities of Jim Crow segregation would shape his mentee and future Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. And it would lead to the Brown versus Board of Education decision overturning segregation. But just as important as the legal fight was the fight to deconstruct white supremacist history of blackness. The Moreland Spingarn Research Center, created in 1930 with the appointment of Dr. Dorothy uh, Porter, firmly established Howard as a major resource center of African American studies. And not just, you know, amongst black people, but presidents would visit Howard University regularly. Calvin Coolidge in the 1920s to Lyndon Baines Johnson in the mid 1960s, where he would outline the polity of affirmative action. Howard was seen as the epicenter of black intellectual life. But despite the fact that Howard was at the forefront of creating change in American society, in other ways, it was kind of behind the curves when it came to the growing self-expression that was happening within black America, especially when it came to the 1960s. During the 1960s, the civil rights movement morphed into the black power movement, partly through the efforts of Howard alum, revolutionary Kwame Ture, AKA Stokely Carmichael, and black student activism on both predominantly white particularly at San Francisco State and historically black college campuses demanded that black studies and institutions that reflected the black experience be presented for black students. And there was also a notion that we need to de-emphasize whiteness and European norms within the curriculum. In short, black students didn't want to be Negropeans. They wanted to be African Americans and have pride in that. And Howard students were no different. Change was coming to Howard, but they didn't know it was coming in the form of a beauty queen. In 1966, the Howard student body made a statement by electing Robin Gregory as homecoming queen. Now wait, electing a homecoming queen is revolutionary? He was, because Gregory was an activist who wore her hair in a natural afro, a new style for the time that became a symbol for black self-expression. And on a campus where the ideals of the black women beauty typically centered around European features, in other words, light bright and almost white, this was indeed revolutionary. According to Howard alum and historian Dr. Paula Giddings, who witnessed Gregory's coronation, the crowd went nuts. The lights went down, the curtains opened as the stage revolved and the lights began to come up. Before you saw Robin, you saw the lights cast a silhouette of her afro. People started jumping and screaming. Some were raising their fists. Then a chant began, Ungawa, Black Power. That simple action lit a spark on the Howard campus. And just two years later in 1968, about a thousand students at Howard University took over the administration building, leading to the shutdown of the school. Their demands, they wanted their president's resignation, a judiciary system for student discipline, an emphasis on African-American history and culture in the curriculum, and the dropping of charges against 39 students who had been arrested for previous protests. President James Nabritt, the university president, had been a genuine hero in the civil rights movement. He had worked alongside Thurgood Marshall to overturn segregation via Brown versus the Board of Education. But he nevertheless become out of touch with the black zeitgeist of the time and the black militancy of the Howard students of the 1960s. It didn't help that he said that he wanted Howard to admit more white students and that the trustees had released a statement saying in part that Howard is not destined to be a black university. To that statement, a group of Howard students hung a handmade sign over Howard that said, Black University. In the end, Howard students were successful in getting most of their demands met, and the president would retire the next year. But Howard would never be the same, and its emphasis on being an authentically Black educational space would continue to evolve. In 1967, Howard students brought Muhammad Ali to campus. Ali was protesting the Vietnam War by refusing to enter the draft, had been stripped of his heavyweight championship and his right to fight. He, in 1967, gave his blackest best speech where he said, all you need to know is know yourself to set yourself free. We don't know who we are. We call ourselves Negroes, but have you ever heard of a place called Negro Land? In 1974, Howard would host the first national conference of African-American writers. The topic, their image of black folks in American literature. 
uh, some such luminaries such as John Hendrick Car uh, Clark, Ozzie Davis, and uh, Haki uh, Mahabuti would appear there. The 1980s would see Howard be politically active. The protests against the South African apartheid government would help divest Howard of investments. And when the racist Republican National Chairman Lee Atwater, architect of the Willie Horton ad for George Herbert Walker Bush, was appointed to Howard Board of Trustees in 1989, hundreds of Howard students protested with a sit-in that eventually led to Atwater's resignation. In 1994, President Nelson Mandela of South Africa visited Howard University. He addressed a special convocation attended by over 15,000 people. Today, Howard students are involved in alternative spring breaks where they volunteered in places like Haiti after terrible hurricanes, New Orleans after Katrina, and Puerto Rico recently after a terrible hurricane. And yes, Howard has had some issues like all college universities, allegedly. But as Howard celebrated its 150th year of its founding in 2017, it rightfully continues to celebrate the fact that alums like writer Ta-Nehisi Coates, uh, actor Tariji P. Henson, and actor Chadwick Boseman, yes, the Black Panther, continue the legacy of, of Howard excellence. So to answer the unhelpful colonizer who said Howard should move, I say this. Howard will not be moved, you will move. And long after you're gone from this earth, Howard would thrive. So in the name of Howard alum Isabel Wilkerson, you cannot walk your dog in the wharf of other sons. And Lois Melu Jones didn't paint artistic masterpieces so you can let your four-legged friend pee on the yard. And for any gentrifier who thinks that Howard is just another college campus where students come and go and their fur babies are real life people, know better. Howard University is blackness. Howard University is black excellence. Howard University is the Mecca. And the only dogs allowed on campus better be Q-Dogs. If you love Brain Coco and would like to see more episodes of unapologetic dope black history, please click that subscribe button, click like, and also click that little bell so you can be notified when another Brain Coco is about to drop. Of course, share this video to folks. And a special thank you to my partners at the Metaphor Club out here in Los Angeles. That's where we film it, and we are the epicenter of black intellectual creativity. If you're in town, come in and check us out. We're the co-working space for black folks. Until next time, this is Lawrence Ross. This has been Brain Coco, Dope Black History.